Welcome to this week's edition of Debriefing the Law. I am Joel Oster. I am Chris Marone. And this is post-Super Bowl week, so trust me, we will have time for Chris to gloat at the end of this podcast. I know he's dying to do that. 100%. But also, this is going to be a fun podcast because at the near the end of this podcast, we are going to have back on everyone's favorite interviewer or interviewee, uh, Scott Briscoe. You know Scott. Yeah. He has his website where he has his free legal tips. He does not charge for them. I think he could charge for them because they are worth their weight in gold. But based 100%. upon actual real cases, he has come up with some free legal tips unless you think... These are all going to be solid ones you can use. No, this is kind of like in the America's Dumbest Criminals category. Yes. They're the ones that probably should be obvious, but they are absolutely hilarious. And so we are going to have Scott on at the end of this podcast to go over his free legal tips. But first, um, we have a new setup here for you. You guys can't tell this, but we got a new podcasting setup where Chris and I actually get to see each other while we are doing this podcast. So, Chris, I guess you, I did not give you fair warning. Maybe nope. you didn't know that clothing was necessary. I know we kind of surprised you on that. But, hey, thanks for being a willing participant as we try out this new program. First off, pants or clothing, okay? Just because I'm here <laughs> in pants and pants alone in all my glory, don't get angry with these ripped muscles. Don't get That's angry right. with this this – all that is man that you see on this camera before you. Hey, it you're, is, you're it is a it. rough picture. It, it, are you like a Mr. T fan now? I, get, I see the mohawk going on. I know. I know. It's uh, <laughs> my my wife calls it a um, frat boy flip. Fra um, okay, I like that. She says that my hair looks like all of the other frat boys she sees on TV. And to be fair, there was a time where I was a frat boy, but. Okay. Um, it is it is quite the insult when she says it because she would never date a frat boy. Ah, I see. Well, hey, you know what? It is great to actually to be on. I'm, I'm wondering if this will actually make a difference in the podcast when we can see right. each other. I was recorded on someone else's podcast a month ago, and they used this platform, and I kind of liked it when we could see each other during the podcast. I thought, I know what you were eating while we were trying to do the podcast and things like that. People come into the office, but nonetheless, hey, this is a, um, a post-Super Bowl week, which means apparently the Supreme mm. Court justices are almost off of their their right. midwinter break. I don't even know what this is. They they they, they had a, a Christmas break. They came back and worked <laughs> for a couple of weeks, and then they immediately took another month off. They are not back in session yet, but next Tuesday, I think it is, they will be back in session. So nothing to report right now about the Supreme Court. Though one of these days we are going to have to talk a little bit of Breyer. I want to do an we will. episode where. Yeah, where we just talk about what a great justice and jurist right. he was. Right. It would be amazing to talk about from his, you know, from his appointment, which, if I remember correctly, was near, you know, unanimous to right. the court. It should have been. Uh, or should have been, right? The fact that he's been a pretty moderate left. You know, he's he's sided with the liberal judges a fair amount, but he's also been pretty, pretty down the middle there. And just, you know, the... He's not going to go down in history being remembered as one of the more controversial or outspoken justices, but I think that that his legacy of of you know quiet refrain and setting the the pulse for for the court is gonna it's gonna reverberate for a lot of years. So I think we should have a great discussion about him and his legacy. So Scalia believed that the Constitution should be interpreted the way it was originally intended to go back to the founding fathers. Say, hey, right. what do the people who died two, three hundred years ago, what did they have to say about how our lives should be ruled today? That's what should rule the day. Uh, Breyer was on the other side. He said, you know what? I'm right. going to stick my finger out in the wind and see which way the wind blows. And that's how I'm going to rule today. I hope I've equally disparaged both sides. I don't want to play favorites. <laughs> Do you have a favorite view of interpreting the Constitution? Yeah, I I think that at the time the Constitution was written, society was treating people a lot differently than it is now. And the founders knew that we would need to make changes. That's why they created the amendment process. Right. So I think that a strict interpretation of the founders' intent of the Constitution is a little too stringent for my type because at the time of the writing of the Constitution uh, – you know, 
three-fifths law was interpreted. Women weren't allowed to own property. So I think that there is some room for modern interpretation. The internet wasn't around, right? The that blogs, is true. Like, so but I mean, as I you think, as you mentioned, ahead. though, the founders put in a way to amend the Constitution. Mm-hmm. And so one thought is, well, then go ahead and go through that process. However, I do believe it was Martin Luther King Jr. who said, it is always the right time to do the right thing. The right Something thing. like that. I might be butchering that yeah. that phrase, but nonetheless, I think that I, here's my favorite view of interpreting the Constitution. I got this from my con law professor. Now, he will not take credit for this. I'm sure he will run from this. So I won't even mention his name, but this is what he said. This is the interpretive rule that the Supreme Court justices use more often than not. Are, are you taking note, Chris? I am. Hold on. Here's my look. Good. You can see me now, so you can see my notebook that I'm actually got, taking these notes on. You have law students there at ASU, so I want them to hear <laughs> this great interpretive tool for interpreting the Constitution. All right, here it is. Love it. Go. Any stick to beat a dog. Okay. There, there you okay. go. I'm, I'm, is that plain English? Is there going to be an elaboration? Nope. They, you know what? It doesn't. It doesn't matter how what stick you use. You want the dog beaten. I don't even know who said that because it's a horrible wow. idea. I don't want to beat dogs. You, get the, I, you have you two get... puppies, Joel. You have two golden doodles now. How, exactly. They, how can they you look care. in those beautiful eyes of your dogs and now give that quote? I'm gonna have to they, go pet my dog now. They, they need care. They need nurturing. But nonetheless, the idea is it doesn't matter. A, a Supreme Court justice wants to a, obtain a result, and they are going to use whatever interpretive guide will help them obtain that result. If, as you know what, the Constitution is a living, breathing document, yep, yeah, let's go with that one today because that gets us the result that we want. Or maybe it's right. an original intent because that gets them the result they want. Let's use originalism today. Very right. few jurists are actually principled and they use the same approach every single time, which I have to say is probably right. Because, again, it's never the wrong time to do the right thing, or it's always the right time to do the right thing, however that saying mm-hmm. goes. So maybe they're on to that. All right, well, this is not the week we're going to talk about, Briar. I just mentioned that. We have a lot more important things to cover today before the Supreme Court gets back in session next week. So let's unpack oh some of these recent things. we got to talk about Sarah Palin. I know this week has been devastating for you because Sarah Palin lost her lawsuit to the New York Times not once, but, but twice. twice. Exactly. Three times, <laughs> not once, twice, but three times a lady. Let's do this. You know what? There might be a third time. So let's unpack how she be. lost it be. twice already. Number one, the, this she was allowed to take her case to court, to trial, yes. which surprised a lot of legal experts. But nonetheless, her defamation case against the New York Times went to trial. And while the case was before the jury, the jury was deliberating. The court said, you know what? I've heard the evidence. Nope. And, and here's the deal. Sarah you lost. You, you failed to produce any evidence whatsoever that I think is, is sufficient enough to send this to the jury. Now, I sent it to the jury, but here's why. I don't want to take away any basis of appeal that you yes. have. So I'm just going to let you know I'm ruling against you right now. That's strike one. The jury is going to come back with their own opinion, which, by the way, they did. And they also ruled against Sarah Palin as well. That would be right. a strike two. Chris, any thoughts as to what strike three might be? If she appeals the decision based on judges' undue influence, I was actually reading today in CBS or um, MSN, and they were talking about how the jurors knew that the judge was going to essentially nullify whatever verdict they came in if they didn't agree with him. So that's grounds for Palin and her le- her crack legal team to uh, to appeal that. So I think her third loss is going to be when they try to appeal that, and the court of appeals goes nothing wrong. Nothing yeah, I, it's so hard to get a uh, uh, to appeal this when it went to the jury, and apparently the jury did not know what the court did. The court the, that information was not related to the jury. I do question that, but they will have time to talk to the jurors themselves to see if they right. heard that information from that the judge ruled in that way. But right. nonetheless, uh, the jury ruled against her. The court ruled against her, and so I think she is out of luck. Well, that was this last week. Uh, She lost her case against the New York Times. Also in the legal news this last week, now, Chris, you and I have talked about 
this pandemic. It's been hard mm-hmm. on a lot of people. It's been a hard yeah. on a lot of people's pocketbooks. You know, tough, yeah. uncertain times. Will I be able yeah. to keep my job? Can I go to work? And so whenever we get a a real feel good story about someone who who despite the hard times can still bring home the bacon and provide for the mm-hmm. family. It's just a heartwarming time. So with that set up, Chris, go ahead and talk about this real feel good story where this guy got paid despite it being during the middle of a pandemic. You know, just a guy that just down on his luck, right? He was looking for work. He, you know, he had been laid off. You know, he he contacted this woman who said she had some side work for him to do. <laughs> side she work. had gotten some side work. Right. She had gotten, you know, she, she'd owned a small business in Miami. Um, she was able to receive some PPP pay tech, paycheck protection program funds. I believe okay. she received in the realm of like fifteen twenty thousand dollars Right. I believe she $15,000. Was, right. And she was going to pay Mr. Robinson, um, which always makes me think of the song Mrs. Robinson, but that's a different tangent. <laughs> Um, but Mr. Robinson was to do some wet work, wet for, work for Mrs. Martinez. Now, for those at home who don't know what wet work is, it's a government-related term which means murder. Okay, I did or, not know that. See, I learned oh, something yes. from my own yes. podcast. So, if I am yeah. working in a wet industry, I right. am murdering people for money. Yes. Yes. Okay. The the um. The uh, the clandestine community, FBI, CIA, uh, FBI, all the, all those guys, all the three letter agencies. Um, when someone is known for doing wet work, they okay. are they are a member of a team that is used to unalive people. All right, to, so to this... keep our rating, to keep our good family rating, we're going to use words like unalive, unalive, unalive right. people. I, I, I like that. So, so this person got a PPP loan, which, by the way, I have a, my own small business. I got a PPP loan. I got that uh-huh. loan to make sure the people who work for me could continue getting paid so they can continue yes. with their livelihoods, yes. their lives during the pandemic. So very it, good, it's a good program. Thing. Yes, right. very good program. But apparently, I, now I did not read the fine lines in this PPP application. Does this say anywhere you can't use it for the wet industry? Um, I don't know if it specifically says you can't unalive people, but I feel <laughs> somewhere in the fine print you're not allowed to do illegal acts. Right? Okay, you can't take your PPP there. loan and buy four or five pounds of cocaine, step on it, and deliver it out to the streets. Just, okay, you're you're probably right. Now, just buying that. Ferraris and Lamborghinis and jewelry totally and lavish okay. vacations, that's already been the subject of many persons' ex- expenditures using these PPP loans. Add to that list of things that, that's going to get you in trouble, hiring a hitman to unalive whoever it is you want to unalive. And so that's what happened. Right. Now, the, the details of this murder are very gruesome. This was a lady, and apparently she did not like this other lady. I think there was a romantic tryst going on there as well. Like maybe her husband or her boyfriend was a former mm-hmm. boyfriend and stuff. I'm not sure exactly how all those uh, played out, but they killed this lady in front of her daughter. It was a horrendous yeah. scene. But I got to tell you, Chris, when I heard this story, my thought immediately went to... Al Capone. You know, Al Capone was a horrendous yeah. murderer. Murdered people yes. in cold blood. They didn't get him for the murders. They no. got him for not paying his taxes appropriately. Are we going to see the same thing here where maybe the murder trial might be difficult to prove, but at least we got her for the PPP violation and so send her to Alcatraz? Hey, any way we can get criminals in the United States. Um, that's not true. Any way that we can get middle or lower class criminals in the United States, we're going to do it. Whether that's murder charges or tax evasion or taillight out or, and I'm sure we're going to hear a lot of this coming from Scott when he jumps on. A lot of his legal tips are based in some of this ticky tacky ways that criminals have been arrested. So we'll get her. All right, all right. Well, also in the legal news, uh, and this, I, I don't want to say more of a serious note because obviously the first one did deal with murder, but nonetheless, right. this one is a um, uh, the Sandy Hook 
a, you know, um, um, mass shooting, shooting there of, of yeah. a, it was a school. And, yeah. uh, and so all those many people uh, died. I believe that 20 first graders and six educators lost their lives in this 2012 day where there was this uh, shooting going on. They several of the, the families filed a lawsuit. In fact, I think it's the families of nine of the victims of the Sandy Hook Elementary School shootings. They filed a lawsuit against the gun maker Remington, saying that they should be liable at least in part because of this travesty. Now, Chris, this is gonna be awfully hard for us to unpack because I have so many different thoughts that right. go into this entire legal scheme. So you, you have this horrendous shooting where some person right. who is probably crazed, I think this person had some mental health issues. He then mm -hmm. shot his own mother and killed himself in a suicide. Uh, right. he, he, he murdered these people, horrendous shooting. But at what point are we going to say, you know what, the gun makers, the person who made the gun, should be liable for this shooting. Now, to make this a little bit more complicated, you have a federal law that was passed in 2000 and 2005. It's called right. the Protection of, uh, of Lawful Commerce in Arms Act. And this act states it, it protects firearms manufacturers and dealers mm -hmm. from being held liable when crimes are committed with their products. Now, these companies are not uh, you know, shielded from liability for their own wrongdoings, but basically right. someone takes one of their products and commits a crime with it, and that's the only right. reason you're basing liability. This federal law protects the manufacturers and dealers of these guns. And so mm -hmm. I gotta tell you, Chris, I have a lot of problems with this lawsuit, and I have a lot of reasons why I'm happy with this lawsuit, mm -hmm. but just for the record, I am a supporter of the Second Amendment, though I've only fired a gun twice. I I am not mm -hmm. opposed to reasonable regulations on guns. And these people who are so crazy with, oh, you cannot have any of the, you can't even have the slightest bit of regulations. I have a problem with that. You can have reasonable regulations. That being said, what are your thoughts on this lawsuit and the settlement? I mean, I, I too have lots of thoughts on on the second amendment and guns. Um, I don't know if I would identify as a two a crowd supporter. I am a constitutional supporter. And I believe that like yourself, that there should be reasonable checks on some of the rights, especially to have access to firearms. Um, but that is personal opinion that I don't think really plays into this case. Um, one of the things I realized when I was reading back and looking at it is that we're in the 10 year anniversary of this this mass shooting and looking at this shooting in a vacuum, which the court has to do. We can't look at all the mass shootings that's taken place in America. Um, I really think the families played this correctly to make sure that Remington was held liable for their part in the shooting. They didn't they didn't come out with the emotional argument they were able to come out with the discussion of how they marketed the gun how who they marketed it to what sort of marketing was around it and placing that idea in the head of this this person who obviously have mental issues you cannot murder your mother go murder 20 school kids and then come home and unalive yourself and not have some sort of mental capacity issue that's right. not reasonable prudent person so I think that the way that the plaintiffs in this case, the families of the, the, the children, the nine families, they went about it in a very proper and meticulous way of making sure that this specific type of advertising, which was they advertised it to the kind of beta male, um, they, they advertised it as like one of the guns that you would see in like Call of Duty or Modern okay. Warfare or some of those games. And then they ended the ad with get your man card back. So it was right. a very targeted, like, if I possess this AR, this model of AR, the XM15, then I'm a man. I'm a real man. Right, right. And, I can, and I can use this in urban-style combat, which right. is not the point of owning this type of weapon. We're, we do not want to encourage our citizenry to just start engaging in urban-style combat. Chris, here's the so, problem I have with this, and I agree with the, yeah. everything that you are saying right there. I don't like those ads. I think they're distasteful. Right. I don't even play those video games. Consider your man card reissued. Right. I mean, right, I, right. I just don't like those ads. However, 
there there is no allegation, no proof connecting those ads to what this kid did. So uh, we just talked about the Sarah Palin case where the judge said, I'm going to dismiss this case because even though there's all kinds of evidence that this person should have known, this editor should have known that what he was saying was a lie. I mean, there was an attachment to one of the emails that showed what he was saying was not correct here. In this case, there's no connection between these ads and what these kids did and what this kid did. So, I almost There's, think here is the litigation strategy. We don't like guns. This was a tragedy. Someone has to be liable. Let's make them liable and let's just let the jury ha- have at them because this is such a horrendous ordeal. I mean, at 73 million bucks, I, there's got to be something. Remington's not going to – Remington, NRA, all the gun lobbies out there are not going to just let a, a $75 million verdict or a $75 million settlement come out because there was no – and maybe they, they said $75 million is worth just killing this and declaring bankruptcy for Remington and moving forward on it. And that that's their that's their prerogative to shut down their entire company to say, you know, we're just going to pay this out and be done with it. So Now, what actually happened here, though, to, to go on what you just said, Remington yeah. had already filed bankruptcy. So Remington, even though they're, right. I think, one of the oldest gun manufacturers in America, yeah. had already filed Chapter 11 bankruptcy, sold their assets. This was the insurance company paying out, and they were paying right. out at policy limits. And, and so... I guess the thought is if it had gone further and you had put this in front of a jury, Mm -hmm. I mean, come on, Chris, we know that jury bias exists and you're going to let a jury send a message saying how much we hate gun violence. What a horrible tragedy this was. Let's make someone responsible and someone pay. And this Mm -hmm. will be the case that that, I think that is true. Even though there might not be any valid evidence saying that, that the gun manufacturer here is liable outside of it produced and manufactured the gun, which there's a federal law saying you can't use that as your basis. I am just wondering if that indeed was not the basis here. And yes, the insurance company just wanted out of this case. I, and I get that, that I full on believe it was it, it, and it focused on the marketing campaign. Remington's marketing campaign led, you know, encouraged urban warfare. And I think that this will be, and again, with the Sarah Palin case, we want to make sure that we slap down reporters that are quick to put out false narratives and to put things in a negative light and to contribute to the decay of society. That should not just be for reporters. That should be for marketing individuals. If you are putting out a ad that says you will be a man if you own this gun and you can engage in urban combat if you own this gun, that's a dangerous message to be putting out into the community, and there needs to be some level of corporate responsibility. I I think we have that now. I I think the fact that uh, Remington went out of business, they went bankrupt, Mm -hmm. future gun makers and manufacturers are probably going to be very careful in how they advertise their product because they don't... If this is an example now, they they paved the way. So look, if you do this false marketing campaign, you can get this case in front of the jury. Of course, no insurance company is going to want to get one of these cases in front of the jury because you think 73 million sounds like a lot. No, try putting a B to it. The billions is how much money you would get from a jury if they could actually hold some gun company liable. And by the way, Chris, we're talking about a civil case. We're just talking about, you know, maybe seven to five kind of a vote scenario. This is not a unanimous verdict situation. It is just simply, you know, more people are going to vote on the side of holding the gun companies liable as not. Yeah, you're not going to want to send that to the jury. And so if that's right. true this probably will shut down the advertisements for these products. So maybe a good result, though I would suggest the legal avenue that they got there is probably not all on four squares. That being said, let's talk about one more case here uh, before we get to Scott Briscoe's legal tips. The Dallas Cowboys. See how we are going to talk a little football at the end because that's what you and I like to do. We like to talk football, but the Dallas Cowboys are in the news for legal reasons. Apparently, there was a lawsuit. Actually, I'm not even sure there was a lawsuit, but there was a claim made. So there was a settlement made, and the settlement is what was reported where the Dallas, I believe it was Four Dallas Cowboy cheerleaders sued the Dallas Cowboys or, or brought this claim against the Dallas Cowboys. 
and one of their uh, executives, Richard uh, Dalrymple, for voyeurism claims, saying that he went into the girls' locker rooms to, you know, voyeur, to spy on these cheerleaders as they were changing in the locker room. Now, Chris, did you know about this case as it was ongoing? Not even, I didn't hear about it until yesterday. Like, I didn't yeah. even know what was going on. Do you know if, an, if a lawsuit was actually filed, or was this just a claim that was made that they were trying to get it settled before a lawsuit was filed? I think it was... I don't even think a lawsuit is... I, I, I've been Googling it, and I'm seeing all the headlines, but I'm not able to find any of the, the documents. And those are pretty... Usually on high-profile cases, right. they're pretty easy to find. So I'm thinking maybe a lawsuit was never filed. This was I think just it was something threatened. that was settled. Right. Yeah. And so a couple of interesting things about this. This There are two main claims that were made against Richard uh, Dalrymple. One is that during the 2015 NFL draft, he was seen trying to take an upskirt photograph of Jerry Jones's daughter. Now, Chris, when I heard that, I am thinking, now, I don't have a daughter. Uh, I have two boys. But... If I knew that one of my employees was trying to take an upskirt photograph of Ooh. my daughter and there was any credence to that whatsoever, that guy is looking for a new job to, oh, yeah. in the, within the next hour. He is not staying employed. The fact that he stayed employed despite that claim, I don't know. What, what do you make of that? I mean, if I think a guy's taking an upskirt picture of my daughter, that guy's looking for a new dentist before he's looking for a new <laughs> job. Right. Exactly. And, and take that to the bank. I Right. I, I don't care. You're you're not I'm I'm handling this on my own. Um but it, how how do you keep your who do you know that you can be caught doing that and still have a job outside of Joe Paterno at Penn State? Who do you know? Well, he didn't do that though. The other guy But they right, knew Joe and Joe kept him on, right? That's right, right. That's right. I mean, there was knowledge. There Good was point. knowledge of it. So, so you knew, you knew, and is this just a boys will be boys, and we we need to change that sort of atmosphere? I mean, obviously the NFL needs to be going through some monumental shifts in how they operate their business. We're seeing a lot of this come out, um, but come on, like th that is the easiest, gr and no court in the land will entertain a wrongful termination case. If you were caught taking upskirt pictures of the boss's kid. Right, right, right. Now, this apparently was on TV that because basically just some fan was watching the video of this and saw him do it. So there would be video evidence of this. I just I, I wonder why that video evidence has not surfaced. Maybe it will in right. the next couple of weeks. We'll, we'll be able to see it and judge for ourselves. The other claim is that this Richard uh, Dalrymple accidentally okay that, that's his view they said it was on purpose went into the girl's locker room stood behind something with his cell phone camera out taking pictures of the cheerleaders and so i i, I don't even know what to say about this one mm, no that's that's a lot of mental gymnastics to protect this guy okay so first of all let's just lay it let's, let's lay it out here he said it was an accident Chris, it was an accident. have you ever accidentally went into the wrong locker room ever? No. I haven't either. No. I, I, I will give you this. Um, there was a Costco that was under remodel, and the men's bathroom was shut down, and they took down the bathroom signs. So I okay. went into the bathroom that wasn't shut down, and that happened to be the women's restroom, and I was thoroughly embarrassed and turned around really quickly and left. Okay. All right. So it, it is possible. There is that. I know. I have never in my life accidentally walked into a women's locker room. Have I yes. tried? <laughs> That's a discussion for a later time. All right, all right. I have never so, accidentally walked into a women's locker room. All right. I, I just know the gym that I work out at, if you go to the pool mm -hmm. area, from the pool you have two different doors. One goes to the women's locker room. One goes to mm -hmm. the guys' locker room. I got to tell you, Chris, I read that sign no less than 15 times. I want to make yes. sure 
I'm going into the right locker room. But nonetheless, he just went into the, and he admits it. He goes, yeah, I went in there. It was an accident. And then I turned around and left. Well, apparently he didn't turn around fast enough. And while turning, stuck out his camera, started taking pictures. I don't know. This was settled for 2.4 million dollars now i will say he did retire this last year before the settlement oh. i hope that played into this as well he's retired he's gone we don't have to worry about this anymore let's just be done with this lawsuit so we can move forward i don't know what the final story any final thoughts on this before we move on we gotta get we gotta be better right we have to be better as people there there's the argument to be made that oh it's he's a product of a bygone era and this is it, no we're not we're not playing this anymore we know it's wrong we know it's wrong you quoted Martin Luther King earlier Maya Angelou when we know better we do better and we've known right. better for a long time there you go I like having you on for your hot takes and there you that's yeah. your hot take when we know better we do better is that is that what you just said yep all right well there there you go. Well, we are bringing back everyone's favorite guest, Scott Briscoe. Scott, welcome back to the, the podcast. Joel, it's my pleasure. Always happy to join you guys. I, I, I do want to let you know that since we've last talked, I have decided to add two puppies to my family. But unfortunately, they are golden doodles. Now, I know you are a big dog lover. Huge dog lover. Yeah, Absolutely. I've got a what, what, cocker spaniel and a little rescue dog. Uh, I, I, he's my little West Virginia brown dog. When people ask, what breed is that? <laughs> he's the bestest boy. Full-blooded bestest boy. That's exactly what he is. Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> hey, Scott, would you ever own a golden doodle? No, he's a man. I would own – well, dude, I would own any kind of animal. I've, I've had birds, fish, cats, dogs, turtles, lizards – all, all the above. So, yeah, I, I'm just an animal right. lover in general. <laughs> well, we have 10 inches of snow outside right now, so my golden doodle is absolutely loving it outside. But nonetheless, hey, thanks so much for being back, Scott. Now, you are the keeper of the great legal tips. I'm still waiting for your uh, textbook to come out in law schools. Hey, um, uh, Chris, you, you work at Arizona State University Law School. I do. I am... I am enthralled with this idea that we're going to have a new textbook with solid legal tips because right now we just have cases from the 18th century. <laughs> no no practical what, get... learning here. No practical learning whatsoever. But I can tell you what happened in ISU you... and all sorts of stuff. I want you to get a class on practical tips. Invite Scott in and then fly me down just because I want to witness this. But that would be a fun class. Yeah, this but I'm not on made the ground, of... hands on. <laughs> yes, we get yeah. <laughs> we can get Joel and we can get Sky do the comedian of laws and we could kill it if we were allowed to have in person right. stuff. So Arizona, you have to come here. You got to wear your mask. You got to stand six feet apart. You got to not you know have a good time. It's all sorts of crazy things in Arizona. All we're right. already well, ahead of the good. game because. I've got a, my book is is very close to being published. All the illustrations are turned in, the covers in, uh, all the text is in. I'm just waiting to hear back from uh, the publisher. So your textbook is coming soon, guys. Do you have a time period? No, I cannot ETA? nail them down on that. That's the big question that I keep asking. And um, no, this is the first book I've ever published, so I'm learning these time frames for the very first time, and they're not fast. They're right. almost as fast as the wheels of justice. Hey, I cannot wait till the book comes out. I want the first copy, and then uh, we'll have you back on so you can talk about your great book. Well, let's go over some of your recent tips that you put down there, because I want you to give the backstory for these tips. Let's go over tip number 115. Now, in this tip, you say, and I think this is great legal advice, don't forget to delete your Facebook dating status and suck face pictures before denying to the judge that you're being wooed by a sex offending drug dealer. So walk us through the backstory on that tip. This is a good tip, Joel. This is one where the mother sat on the witness stand and no, I am a good mother and no, I would never date a man like that. He deals drugs and he's a sex offender and I don't know even who you're talking about. And I'm sitting at counsel table next to the prosecutor who just presses a button and up pops 
her Facebook screen and <laughs> dating status. And there he is. And she's dating him. And then the string of pictures of them in their various make out poses. And, and like I said, <laughs> suck face pictures. So it's kind of hard to deny to the judge when it's right there, you know, on their social media page. <laughs> oh, but they'll do it. So she's just oh, they will hundred percent do it. Oh, they will. They will deny it, and then you you press the button and put it up on the big screen, and then they just they hang their head. <laughs> oh man, I th- I love the use of Facebook to contradict lying witnesses. Uh, I, I we had one episode; it was in a case, and we were in depositions in Michigan, and we we're asking the other guy if he knew anyone, and it's like. No, I have no idea who this person is who you're talking about. Like, are you sure you don't know this person? No, I have never met that person before. Okay. And then we handed him a copy from his Facebook page right. the day before. And we said, is this a copy from your Facebook page yesterday? Yes. Does it not show you you guys are friends as of yesterday? Yes, it does. Mm-hmm. Okay. If I were to go to your Facebook page right now, would I see him as a friend? No. <laughs> Why not? I just deleted him as my friend <laughs> walked into this deposition. He's right there on his phone. <laughs> exactly. We then took a break, and the lawyer met with his, this witness in the parking lot. We could hear him yelling from upstairs, and the case quickly settled after that. Nice. So I love the advent of Facebook when it comes to you know impeaching witnesses during depositions. All oh, right. yeah. Free, free legal tip number 114. <laughs> Gas up before going on the run with property you stole from the sheriff. I, I think it's always a good idea to gas up before taking any kind of trip. But you're saying you in particular, so. if you're if you're going to steal something, you might want to gas up before that. Give us the backstory. Yeah, if you're going to go on the lamb, you got to be ready. <laughs> and in this situation, the uh, co-defendants, um, I won't name them to protect the guilty, um, they decided to go on what they thought was abandoned mining property and see what they could find, copper or any kind of material. Right. What they found right. was the sheriff's department's um, shooting range and a lot of their materials that the, the sheriff's department left out there for practice. So they loaded up the truck bed with all of the sheriff's property, the, the targets and, and whatever else was out there, uh, barrels, a, a bunch of stuff. And they went back through town, through Danville, which is a population of maybe 500 people. And they pull into the Go-Mart, a brightly lit gas station in a very small town. And it just so happens a deputy happened to be parked right there getting gas. (laughs) When they pull up to the pump next to him, and he just glances over and he sees, those are our target (laughs) practice uh, sheets. Those are our barrels. And and, uh, they were out of gas, so they had stopped. To get gas. That's why they uh, ran into the deputy. They weren't prepared to take off with all the goods fast enough. So, boom, wow. busted right there at the wow. go mart. <laughs> you know what? I... Tell me you argued a legal search. Say that that was a warrantless, or that oh. wasn't an exception to the warrantless search, and the police wasn't lawfully, you know, positioned, and, and see how that rolled out. I would have loved to have done that, but uh, unfortunately, these were not my clients. They were appointed to other <laughs> counsel, so. And the, the tip just came along. And actually, it was even the sheriff's department had, had posted on their page about the defendant you, stealing their ever, property. Have you ever had this thought that you could really be a good criminal? I mean, I, I've often thought, you know what? Look at that crime. He made a simple mistake. I never would have made that mistake. If I were to do that crime, I would do it so much better. Does that make me a bad person that I've had those thoughts? No, I think those are all thoughts that defense counsel has, even when you're watching like Forensics Files or NCIS or any of those shows. Yeah. No, I could have done that better. I've had enough experience with my clients to know not to do that. (laughs) Well, I think those are some pretty like obvious things. Like we're, I love these tips, right? They're, they're friggin' great because we've all had some similar type of experience with a defendant being stupid or doing something like that. But you're like, Come on, guy. Every case in your textbook is so he had an out tail light or his registration was expired. And you're like, I could see them overlooking that, but I'm out of gas. Like, I drove to the police station drunk. All of those types of things, like, those are the ones that are my favorite. Because, yes. Yeah. Right. If you're going to be transporting drugs, don't have a busted tail light. Uh, right. Don't have uh, your um, have your registration, have your license, right. have your insurance. Don't have a reason to get pulled over for some other. Right. 
extraneous reason that's going to end up, you know, in prison over cocaine and heroin and fentanyl. Right. All the fun. I'm thinking of big three. I'm thinking of one. I'm thinking of one case I heard about last year where this guy went to the DMV to get his registration and license renewed, which is fine. He then goes to a bank to hold up the bank and they wanted something in writing. So he took this receipt out, turned it over and said, give me whatever, all your money. And so, yeah, he used his receipt from the DMV to hold up a bank. I see. I would not have done that. I would no. have known to ask for the, a blank copy of a piece of paper and then write my hold up note on that and not use my receipt. The deposit slip. Yeah, it brings it's to right mind there. The tip where the guy stole someone's um, credit card and used it to pay his utility bills. So his address <laughs> pops up on the victim's you know, statement. <laughs> Let's you know just what? hand them all the information they need. <laughs> right. Great, great tip. All right. Free legal tip number 113. Now, I've never done this, uh, so you're going to get some explanation. I've never done a drug test in my life. Drinking ice water just prior to your drug test does not <laughs> sufficiently explain to your probation officer the ice-cold urine sample allegedly fresh from your hoo-ha. Now, I think a hoo-ha is a legal term. So can you explain yes. the, the backstory here? Yes, yes. This is a, a frequent flyer. She... Um, has gone through the criminal system for many years. I've represented her and many other members of her family. Um, going to the courthouse for them is just like going to the post office for us. And I had already had her on probation for uh, drug violations. And so she was checking in with the probation office like she's supposed to. And I get a call from the probation officer, Sarah. Um, shout out to Sarah Randolph. Sarah says, Scott, you're going to have to hear what your client did this time. And I said, well, lay it on me. And this kind of gets a little graphic and a, and a little gross. So, so bear with me and feel free to censor as needed. But <laughs> as soon as Sarah says, today is your random drug screen. Sarah said, I looked in your client's eyes and I could instantly tell she was going to be positive for something. So my client paused and goes, you don't want to go in the bathroom with me. I've, I've got the diarrhea really, really bad. <laughs> Sarah says, no, I have to go into the bathroom with you to collect the sample. I don't care if you have the diarrhea. So then my client pauses again and gives it a second go and says, and I'm on my period too. And the, the probation officer says, you're not going to gross me out. I'm a mom. I have seen it all. Right. I have touched it all. I'm coming right. in the bathroom with you. Okay. So they go in the bathroom and Sarah stands outside the stall. My client goes into the stall, shuts the door. And she's not in there 10 seconds. And she comes out with a cup of clear water where she had clearly just taken the cup and dipped it in the toilet and came out with a cup of toilet water, clear toilet water. So she hands the cup to Sarah. She goes, here you go. I peed. <laughs> and Sarah goes, you didn't pee. You just dipped the cup in the toilet and handed me toilet water. No, I didn't. That's my pee. And Sarah goes, then why is it ice cold? And my client without missing a beat. And I have to give her credit here because, guys, she tried to use logic. She tried to use reasoning. She goes, you want to know why I was ice cold? Because you made me drink all that ice water. I love <laughs> so it. So Sarah had to explain. Yeah. Because <laughs> she wasn't you know going to give a, a sample at all to begin with. So she had to drink a lot of ice water. And Sarah had to explain to her, you know what? Even ice cream comes out steaming as pee. <laughs> right. Right. Now, this, I love that. On this next free legal tip, Ridiculous. I am wondering if this is funnier to those of us outside of West Virginia and Arkansas. Oh, no. But I still, want, I still want your backstory on this one. This is free legal tip number 107. When listing your relationship to the respondent in a domestic <laughs> violence protective order petition, it's okay to list that you are dating Volunteering that he's also your first cousin is just superfluous. And so what is the yes. backstory on dating your first cousins and were they good looking? Oh, well, <laughs> this is, and I've told you in my other podcasts, since I started doing these tips, judges, bailiffs, police officers, other lawyers, they all get excited to call me when something like this <laughs> happens. And, right, and in right. this situation, right. it was the family court judge's secretary that called me up, Scott. You're not going to believe what I'm looking at right now. Applied for a DVP and they're in a relationship and their cousins. <laughs> and I think they were like third cousins twice removed. But the fellow, 
I guess he felt that he had to disclose everything, you know, there in the form. So it wasn't my case personally, but the, the, the family court judge's secretary called and said, you have to see this because he even listed that they are cousins while they're dating. So I, I never met them. Wow. And I, that's all the details I got. But what more do you need? <laughs> right. Hey, you know right, what? Right. When in Rome, do as the Romans. Ooh. So when in West Virginia slash Arkansas, I probably just lost all of our listeners in West Virginia and Arkansas. But nonetheless, <laughs> uh, all right, before we let you go, Chris, any any of these free legal tips do you think you can personally use? <laughs> wow. I'm going to go with... Actually, I want to go with tip 112 is the one that I'm going to use more okay. often. That is going to be the um, don't get your prescriptions filled while you're in jail. I think that your <laughs> I believe the tip is your pharmacist might not fill your prescription when your call is interrupted with. This is a recording from a West Virginia facility. You were speaking with an inmate. <laughs> might might be an issue. It, it, it might depend on the drug, right? Am I getting? Am I exactly. getting like an antihistamine? Am I getting Viagra? Am I getting some metformin? I, I don't know. Maybe the maybe is it going to a women's prison? Who knows? You know but I feel I feel that one that one especially you know being Arizona, California, Colorado, you know I want to get my weed prescription filled. Are we gonna send that into prison? Just saying. It's a all right, Scott. Anything well, to fill in on that story? Well, you would be surprised if you go through the comments on on that tip. How many people didn't see a problem in that or thought that it was legit? Why can't you call your pharmacist from the jail to have your drugs delivered to you? It's a prescription. So right. you had to explain, we, well, they have doctors in the jail. Right. And we don't abuse <laughs> prescriptions as a society. I mean, that's not something. I'm not no. going to use my prescription and sell it for, you know, the better portion of Top Ramen. Ne never. Ne never. Right. I'm not going to trade well, it for so I, I don't have a boyfriend. All these corrections right. officers start commenting. No, it's true. You can't just call your. So it's funny. These groups that I have uh, uh, that follow me, the corrections officers, the judges, the lawyers, the, the police oh, yeah. officers, and they all we all get to experience these shining moments of, of insanity. <laughs> well, there you go. Free legal tips. The rest are going to start charging for, but we are good. We are looking eagerly for your book. Let us know as soon as it comes out. We'd love to have you back on. And then of course you promote it on our podcast. So hey, have a good day and go out there and find some more tips. Hey guys, thanks for having me. Always a blast. All right. Moving on now to courtroom quarterback. My moment. This is my moment. This is your moment to shine. So I'm going to give you the floor. What do you want to say about how great this week has been for you? Called the Super Bowl down to almost the score, right? Called the absolute game. Though um, I did in our texts while Joel and I were, were going during the Super Bowl, I called that Cooper Cup would be the MVP as well. I think that that was an incorrect call. I do believe that Donald should have been the MVP. He came up big the entire game, and though Cooper Cup was a great receiver and he's explosive on the field, that game was won because of L.A. Rams defense. 100%. I agree. Now, I learned that the MVP voting takes place at about two minutes before the game ends. Now, they, they you, you can wait a little bit, but it's just like when they do the MVP voting during the regular season – it's done before the season actually concludes. I don't know why. They should reject yeah. every single vote that's turned in before the end of the game because the most critical moments, the, the moments when the game is won and or lost, usually happens in the last two minutes, especially of close games. And so in this particular case, I believe that Cup, uh, what is your nickname for the Cup Meister? Oh, it's King Cup, King Cooper, King Cup. All right, King Cup. King Cup. He had Played just King's scored Cup. that touchdown. Had a remarkable drive. Finally came back. Had four catches, I believe. That was an incredible performance, and that won him the MVP. Nothing right. against uh, the uh, the Cup Meister and uh, King Cup. Right. That was an amazing performance. But I still think in this day and age of high scoring offenses. The game was won due to Donald's performance in 100%. that last drive. The first one is third down and what? Third and two? Is that right? Yeah. 
Yeah. And and the running back gets past him. He reaches out, grabs that running back, right. stops him in mid stride. His forearms must be massive. Pulls him back 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 down for you know a yard less uh, short of the first down. An amazing right. play, all day. I mean. Donald was double teamed the entire game. And when he wasn't double teamed, he was making huge plays. And if anybody is curious on the, the size and scope of Donald, go watch the LA Rams Super Bowl parade. The cat okay. walked around shirtless the entire time. <laughs> I'm a hundred percent sure he was chiseled out of wow. solid rock. The guy is, I mean, I had to it, I had to turn my wife away. I want to stay married. I had to be like, no, babe, no, nothing to see here. Noth- nothing to wait, see wait here. This beautiful man. Wait, 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 wait a second. Did you turn her eyes away or your eyes away? Did I did I miss that? I ch- <laughs> Fifth Amendment. I I plead the Fifth Amendment for all of the rest of the discussion of Andrew Donald. Hey, we got to have goals. We, we have to have yeah. goals oh, in our gosh. own personal workout to keep ourselves right. focused. Well, that, that was For third sure. down, an amazing right. play. When I saw that, I thought, okay, that, that was huge. But I just knew they were going to get a first down. I mean, it was, what, fourth yeah. and one. Yep. What were your thoughts as that ball was being snapped on fourth and one? That we're going for it. That that the Bengals are going to push downfield. They've been pretty good about converting fourth downs the entire playoffs. Like, I, I literally thought that – Burrow was going to do a quick like slant play and just pop a receiver. This is where I told everyone in my in my viewing party, like right. this is what they should they should do. Absolutely blitz the quarterback. The one thing you cannot yes. do to a quarterback is give him time because he just needs one yard. He'll find right. that receiver who's open for a one yard game. So apply the pressure right away. Maybe keep one safety back who can you know come back right. in and make prevent the touchdown from from occurring. Yeah. But still, Jalen or something. Put pressure on him right away. Put him on his back. And that's right. exactly what Aaron Donald did. Got in there well, with the immediate pressure and just put him on his back within seconds. Well, and it stops the run game, right? If you know that the entire defensive line of the Los Angeles Rams are raining down on the horrible offensive line of the Bengals, that stops the run game that immediately makes Joe Burrow have to throw the ball. I love it. I put pressure on force the issue. I cannot stand right. it when my Chiefs do the opposite. My Chiefs will like say, you know what? We are going to play this long game. We're going to play it out. We're going to send everyone back in coverage. And yeah, right. we'll give you that first down, but we don't want you to score quickly and, nope. and score the touchdown. No, I like nope. forcing the issue, attack him, and within seconds. And this brought up one of these issues that maybe this, this rush to anoint Joe Burrow's as the best quarterback since Tom Brady, might be a bit short-sighted. And here is why. He holds on to the ball too long. Tom yeah. Brady's genius is that he goes back there. He knows a scenario. The ball is out of his hands within seconds. Joe Burrow doesn't do that. Yes, Joe, you can get away with that when you're playing the Kansas City Chiefs. Everyone knows they have no defense. But against right. a decent defense like the Rams... You right. gotta get ball, uh, get rid of the ball quickly. So that leads me to this question. I'm gonna make a statement, Chris, and I want Ooh. you to tell me: Is this an overreaction, or have I pegged it? Am I Nostradamus? Here is my reaction: We have seen the last of Joe Burrow as an elite level quarterback. He is done. This is his, I guess, two mm. years and done. He rose to the top, but this talk of him being elite is now done with. Well, that's a, man, that is quite the prediction after a season and a half of Joe Burrow. I think um, I think Joe could be an elite quarterback. Um, but I also think, like, Dan Marino is an elite quarterback and just never got anywhere. I think that Joe right. Burrow could carry, carry the Bengals for as long as possible. Um, but unless he gets some support on that O-line, he's, he's going he's gonna to fizzle out. I think that skills-wise... Joe could hold his own. I think also it's not just a individual position team. Yes, the quarterback can turn the tides of a game very quickly. We saw that Bills Chiefs, right? You know, but you know, Joe needs he needs something. He needs people that can can actually protect him on the O line. He needs and you know, I who I think it's a bit of an overreach, but I'm not gonna okay. say you're wrong. 
Whoa, 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 whoa. You got to take one side or the other. Nope. I, I'm gonna, am, I, is that an overreaction or not an overreaction? I, hmm. I'm going to go with it's an overreaction. Okay. All right. Now let, let me tell you why you're wrong. Uh, cool. So, I love this. <laughs> I, I, you were waiting, too. You're like, say it. Say that I'm wrong, Chris. <laughs> You just sent me a meme, which is a very I interesting did. meme, where it showed that during Tom Brady's career, in his first year, the Saint, the Rams won the title. Kurt Warner yep. was an amazing quarterback. He ended his career with the Rams winning the title. That just got yes. that just reminded me about how much I loved Kurt Warner. Do you know what Kurt Warner right. was known for? getting rid of the ball quickly. He can right. make decisions in a split second. So I'm going to just suggest that this talk out there that, oh, the, 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 the Bengals offensive line is so horrible. Joe, you know, Burrow needs protection. Maybe not. Maybe he's holding on to the ball too long. And yeah, he's a tough guy, but you know what happens to tough guys in the NFL? They have short careers because the defensive of linemen are huge. And if you can't learn to get rid of that ball a little quicker, your career is going to be very short. And as it's being shortened, your productivity level is going to go down as well because that's just the nature of the beast when you're getting pummeled by the likes of chiseled men like Aaron Donald. So here's the real question. Is the fact that he gets sacked so many times a product of the bad offensive line or is it maybe that he just doesn't make quick decisions? He's not a Kurt Warner, and he does not get rid of the ball quickly, and he's been able to get away with it so far. But if you keep up with this, your time in the NFL, your days are numbered. Yes, and I, I agree with that. I I don't disagree that he needs to get away, get away from the ball or get the ball away quicker. He just <coughs> – sorry. that <coughs> That comes with experience. Yes, Tom Brady had it right off the bat, and he's the GOAT and all that jazz. But I think even if you look at some of the other quarterbacks, getting rid of it quicker is an acquired skill. And it's not, you know, he's still in that rookie year of, holy crap, and, you know, Donald's coming at me at full force. What do I do? What do right. I do? Deer in headlights. I think it will develop in a couple years, unless he gets hurt again. But right. we'll see. We'll see. That's why right. we'll I see. Yeah, time, time will tell. That's why I'm making that statement. I just wonder now. if his offensive line – it's bad, but is it that bad? Or does he share some of the blame? And if he shares the blame, does he really have a processing unit like Kurt Warner had, one of my favorite quarterbacks? Right. He knew how to get, up, get rid of the ball very, very quickly. And I'm not sure Joe Burrow has that same skill. All right, next thought I had from the, the Super Bowl. Well, first of all, I got to tell you, I was disappointed by the commercials. In fact, yeah. we were like midway through the game, and I was talking to someone else that was at my party. It's like, have there been any commercials that you could say that that's a memorable commercial? That is the Budweiser commercial from 2022. Right. I don't know if there was one. Maybe there's one commercial that I'm just not thinking of right now, but overall, I was disappointed in the commercials. I, I was through. I was, I was impressed by the Mary J. Blige mammogram commercial. So okay. to tell you that the only commercial I really remember was the NFL allowing people to encourage them to get mammograms. That was the level of commercials that came out of it. There was a, a Cheetos commercial, I think, where there was a bunch of talking animals. Right. Um, yeah. That's the all, commercial that's... with the person wearing those, those three uh, 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 virtual reality goggles. Do you remember that commercial? There was one that was some. I don't even know what it was about. I know my son talking about it later on. But oh. yeah, that was one good commercial. I remember the the virtual reality goggles that he had on. Because my son has those, and I tried them. They're a lot of fun, but mm -hmm. nonetheless, um, uh, that was problematic. Yeah, it was lackluster. Right. It was lackluster. Yeah, I was very disappointed. Halftime right. show. Halftime show was amazing. All right, we're gonna Absolutely. talk about this now. I I did not I want to bring it up, but since you let's brought it. it up, let's, let's do talk amazing. about amazing. Amazing. Right. You realize you realize what you just did there yeah, is you yeah, engaged. I started it. I started it. In you engaged in age yep. discrimination. You are trying yes. to make me feel bad for nope. how old I am. Because I nope. gotta tell you, I did not like the halftime show. But I gotta tell you, Chris, I don't like any halftime shows. One right. year, my favorite, my beyond favorite singer of all time is Shania Twain, and okay. she had a halftime show, and I said. I hate this. I, I don't like right. it. 
Right. Why do they have these halftime shows where you can't even hear the entertainers? I don't get it. it it's to, again, it's money, right? They figure they'll attract a more diverse viewership crowd if there's a good halftime show. They feel that um, this is all sports entertainment, so they have to have a halftime show. I think halftime shows are hit or miss throughout the years. I remember the Maroon 5 halftime show where Adam Levine ran around with his like top off the entire time and he looked like a desk from detention because of all of his tattoos. And it that wasn't might good be ha- good, but depending on the your visual class. aspect. Well, right. because of the visual aspect, but with the audio, the audio is just it, it's it's never not good. Quality audio. It's and, never, well, you're how are you open have quality airs- audio? Yeah, you can't. You right. can't have a five-minute setup to a twenty-minute show that has a five-minute breakdown, so that way we can get back to this football game and expect it to be top quality audio, visual, the whole nine yards. The audio is crap. But I went to once a boys to men concert. Do you, I know Ooh. you're a lot younger than me. Do you remember? No, boys no, I've to been men? to boys. I've I've been to their concerts three times. Okay, here is my take. Now this is gonna make me sound extremely old. I get it, but. Mm-hmm. There was a, I don't know the guy's name, but he was the bass singer, an amazing okay. singer. I love listening to Boys to Men. I love listening to this guy. He had a solo part. Do you know how the crowd responded to his solo? Did they by boo screaming him? at the no by screaming oh. at the top of their lungs? They were so excited that this bass singer was going to sing a solo. They were just going bonkers. Which do you know what that actually produced? The result of that. No out one. The solo. Exactly. It's as if this yeah. guy was so bad. We got to drown him out. We don't want anyone listening. So let's all shout at the top of our lungs. I understand. Right. I want to hear him. I had to stick my fingers in my ears and that didn't even work. I could not hear this guy sing. That might have been the last concert I went to. I was so disillusioned by the quality of open air concerts or it doesn't even matter. Even regular yeah. concerts indoors, you can't hear the music. So that no. was my big beef with it. Uh, uh, you know, I, I could not understand a single word that was said, and so I, I had no enjoyment. Oh, I loved it. It brought me back to my childhood. I mean, that's that's the era I grew up in was 92 Snoop Dogg, 92 Dr. Dre, all the way up to early 2000s Eminem and Mary J. Blige. And, you know, the only one that I really didn't connect with was Kendrick Lamar because I wasn't a huge fan of his. And he seemed a little out of place. But, I, I mean – me, my wife, or friends that were at our house, the only people who really didn't enjoy it were my uh, in-laws because they're not rap music fans, <laughs> and I get it. Like, I told it's not your genre of music. It's not your jam. Like, my father-in-law's like, why can't James Taylor and Neil Diamond play the Super Bowl? And I'm like, who is going to watch James Taylor and Neil Diamond do a Super Bowl halftime show? Now, I like rap music, but you know right. who actually is a good rapper? The last rapper I listened to uh, that I had basically every line memorized. G- hit me with this. Will Smith. Did you, did you know Will Smith was a rapper? Yes. Yes. Hit yes. Way back Jazzy. in the day. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, summertime. Oh, such great songs. I could actually hear what he was saying. I enjoyed it. Oh. And then Tone Loke came right after him. I love Tone Loke. But now that I just can't hear it. I can't understand can't. it, and so I cannot enjoy it. But, hey, that aside, that has to deal with me being old. So I appreciate you dig- getting some digs in for my elderly age. You see my white in my goatee. You think I'm Colonel mm-hmm. Sanders, and so you just can't help yourself. All right. Well, I see that AARP is sponsoring you there in the background. So, I mean, I figured we, we got to get these in here. That's right. So one last thought here. Who benefited the most from this year's Super Bowl. Now, la- my prediction last week, which I have not mentioned yet because I was wrong, though it was no fault of my own. I said, I don't know if you remember this, that this was going to be a breakout game for OBJ. That was going to be the headline. The OBJ, he had a $100 million contract on the line, and during the first half, he was amazing. I oh, believe he had yes. a touchdown. He had almost 50 yards. Yeah. He had a lot of receptions because the defense was focused on uh, King Cup, which I also predicted yep. that would leave him being open. Yep, him. The problem is he then blew out his knee. This thing is probably going to be yeah. another uh, you know, knee injury, uh, MCL, ACL injury. ACL, yeah. And, and this, this, this might be the end of his career. I don't know because this was the second injury, I think in two, maybe three years, to the same knee. If you're an NFL player and you can't even plant on your knee, 
you don't really have a long future. So I'm going to say he did not benefit the most, as I predicted. Who do you think benefited the most from this year's Super Bowl? Oh, Cooper Cup. Cooper okay. Cup benefited the most, mainly because, um, I mean, everybody talks about how he was an Eastern Washington player. He had no Division One offers. Now he's a Super Bowl. Giving him the MVP really raised Cup's stock a lot. I think OBJ benefits a little from it. He'll get a good deal, but because of that knee injury, it's not going to be the $100 million that people thought it was going to be. Um, Andrew or Aaron Donald and – you know, a couple of the linemen from uh, the guy who won the Walter Payton Award, they're looking at right. retirement anyways. So Jalen Ramsey did not, did not fare well in the Super Bowl. <laughs> he did. So he I looked bad. He, he looked bad. So wow. for, from the Rams side, I think Cooper Cup comes out the big winner because he's still got a lot of years of his career ahead of him. Matt, uh, you know, Safford is could retire, right? 13 years in the league, Super Bowl ring, go out on top. Yes. Who knows? But he's not looking. He's not staring down a million dollar, hundred million dollar contract. So I think Cooper Cup's stock raised the most, and I think it's only because he got the MVP. I don't think it had anything to do with his playing. Because he got the MVP trophy, that's going to raise his stock more. And I'll, I'll give you that because I do believe there's a difference between putting up stats during the regular season, and then putting up stats when the entirety of the entire world is watching right. you and everything is right. on the line. He put up those stats despite the fact OBJ went down and now all of the attention of the defenses were on him. Despite that, he caught four uh, uh, receptions on the last drive plus the touchdown. Oh, and I'm not even mentioning that fourth and one play, which was a brilliant right. play by him. Beautiful. They were back at their own 30 yard line, fourth and one, and they did a sweet play with him. He knew exactly when to cut it upstream and got that first down, a huge play. Yep. So I agree with you that um, he went from just being a great player to an all-time great player with that one performance. I'll also throw out there uh, Sean McVay, the coach of the Rams. A lot of talk is that he might even retire now. Chris, he's younger than you are. He's, young, right. he's way younger than me. Right. This, and they're saying he's already accomplished it. He now might go into TV. He has such a great personality. Mm -hmm. he's, he's a made that. man. Now that he's won the Super Bowl, he's the made man. He'll probably come back for a few more years. But obviously, winning a Super Bowl puts you at a whole other level in the echelon right. of coaches. So that might have uh, cemented his, his Hall of Fame status. All right. That being said, hey, Chris, it was a great week. Have a great week, and we will talk to you next week. Thanks, everybody. Thank you for listening to today's podcast. If you enjoyed this podcast, please give us a five-star review. We need your love to help us continue highlighting the funnier side of the law. I want to give a special shout-out to our Vice President of Operations, Wendy Oster, without whom this entire operation would be a mess. Sean Wynn and 15.5 Features for making me sound way better than I actually do. Brooke Bolin for spreading the good word about us. And Ryan Kuhn and Paul Kuhn of Triplicity Marketing for our technical and computer support. Mm -hmm.